Hey, what's going on? In this interview, I talked to Carl Jensen, also known as Mr. 1500. Carl and his family are financially independent, or FI, and he retired at age 43. And some time ago, back in 2012, Carl had a very bad day at work and he was like, you know what? How can I retire early? So he Googled it and went down this path that somehow brought us together <laughs> after a few years. It was a pleasure to interview Carl and we talk about uh, a lot of different things. We talk about office space a little bit. We of course talk about how he retired early and really the definition of retirement because you will uh, hear in this interview that Carl actually stays pretty damn busy at this point in time. And you know, some people would argue, hey, maybe you're not actually like retired because you're still doing some work. So we actually get into the details of that. And then, you know, he gives his opinion, I give my opinion, and curious to hear what your opinion is. By the way, if you have any questions for Carl, please be sure to leave a comment. Um, we'll try and monitor them pretty closely and get back to you in a timely manner as much as we can. We talk about how to retire early, maybe if you are not yet on the path to early retirement, things that you can do. We talk about the 4% rule, which is sort of a, a cool idea. And if it's the first time that you've heard of the 4% rule, then uh, I think you're gonna be pretty excited about it. We also talk about blogging. Carl runs a blog called 1500days.com. And it's pretty cool because he's, he's mostly known for his financial independent, just knowledge and sharing his journey and his story and all that stuff. But we talk about his traffic and his revenue because I know most of my normal audience is mostly interested in you know, building websites, earning money from those websites, uh, maybe on the side and that sort of thing. And it's pretty cool because Carl wasn't trying to earn money from his website for the first uh, like few years. In fact, he said he only earned like a hundred bucks in the first three years. Three years, he only earned a hundred bucks. We go all over the place, so I will stop rambling on and I want to give a, a quick plug for you know Carl's YouTube channel. Check out his blog as well. There's gonna be a link in the description. And if you are new to this channel, my name's Doug Cunnington. I talk about affiliate marketing, productivity, niche sites, making money on the side, SEO. We usually get pretty deep into the weeds and this interview with Carl sort of marks this um, inflection point where I'm going to start talking to FI um, bloggers and influencers and just interesting people that are either financially independent already or they are on the way. So check out some of the other videos if you're interested in getting into affiliate marketing or checking out a side hustle. You may like some of the other videos out there. So without further ado, Carl Jensen, Mr. 1500. I asked you about office space earlier. I told you to think about office space. And if you're like me, we're roughly the same age and we worked in software and uh, you must really like office space. Do you have a favorite scene? I do like office space, but this brings up a story. Um, Office Space came out at about the first time I had my first, it came out when I had my first real job. And at the time I was working for probably one of the worst bosses I ever worked for. I'll call the guy Merv. Merv was an interesting character because he was a micromanager. He liked to know exactly what we were doing. He would stop by our cube like every 15 minutes and we'd catch him like peering over the cube wall. And then the other thing he was real weird about is he didn't want us to talk to anyone else in the organization. So... If he saw us talking to someone from another team, he'd take us back like to a secret room and ask us what we were doing and why we were talking to this person. And uh, we'd catch him like eavesdropping on our conversations too. And the reason I'm telling you all this is because this manager looked exactly like what was the character's name, Milton, the guy who they shoved in the basement of, of Office Space. So when I saw Office Space and that character came up, I don't think I enjoyed the movie like I used to. And uh, I haven't watched it since then, but I should to see if I have flashbacks about the job. So I thought it was a great movie and uh, it was very reflective of my career in IT at the time. <laughs> that character, I'm uh, still just thinking about it now, it gives me the willies. I have no idea what happened to that manager, but uh yeah, I went on a big tangent there. So yeah. there's my office space story that probably no one else in the world has. Yeah, well, funny funny thing. One of my early bosses at a co-op job 
he looked like Lumberg. So with the glasses and oh. suspenders and like he would come and I mean, we worked on weekends yeah. and I, you know, I was only getting 12 bucks an hour, oh. which was a lot, yeah. you know, in college. I was like, this is fantastic. I get oh. time and a half on the weekends. But um, yeah, he was like, hey, can you come in? We're doing oh. shift work. Oh. You know, can you come in in the afternoon and stay late? Luckily, I was pretty nerdy. So that was fine. It wasn't a big deal. Yeah. What was your favorite part from the movie? There, uh, I can't remember the quote exactly, but Peter is saying, uh, like, humans weren't meant to spend, spend their time in cubicles, we're meant to be outside, and, like, enjoy life. Yeah. So I think Very good. a theme is going to come, you know, through the, our conversation here around to that. But I always think about it, especially, like, once I got out of the, the cubicle and at least could work from home. I was like, this is much better. I could go walk outside, take a break. No one's like coming into my cube, looking over my shoulder Yep. Um, and all the FaceTime that you have to, you know, spend just to like get promoted or something like that. Yeah. Sometimes the best worker does not get promoted. And that was always kind of depressing. It was the best brown noser, especially at the same company that I mentioned before. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I could go off on that forever, but we don't want to hear those stories. Yeah, I was going to say I can go off on another tangent in that direction too, but reel it back in. The reason why we're we're chatting is you have a very interesting story because uh, you're relatively young and uh, you've retired. So how did you end up at this point? And, and you could sort of like take your time, take us on the journey here. Yeah, sure. And I don't mind sharing my age. I am, we'll work backwards. I am 46 now. I just turned 46. I stopped formally working at the age of 43. And I got this whole idea when I was 37. I remember it was October of 2012 and I, I was in software like we talked about. And uh, for the most part, it was a good job, but this particular job was writing code for a medical device. So and previously I had worked in industries like insurance or point of sale systems where if you mess up the code, you might quote someone the wrong price for an insurance policy or you might charge someone the wrong taxes for a purchase. But in this case, if I screwed up the code, I could potentially cause serious harm or kill someone. So that, that was bad for two reasons. Uh, the number one reason was just the stress. You always had this kind of dark cloud over your head thinking. It, it, it's not like a job where you're a pilot where as soon as you go home, the stress is done. You've done your job. But this, I could have potentially introduced a bug in the code five years ago that could harm someone that I just that's been hidden all this time and took a weird situation to come up. But the other reason was I didn't do a whole lot of coding. It was mostly writing documentation for the FDA, dealing with audits. So I'm sure you were a software guy. Like I, I love the code writing part of the job. That part was really fun and cool trying to solve the puzzles. But everything that went along with it was not good. But And I had this job for a while. But at one point in October 2012, we thought there was a bug in the code and I thought I caused it. And it was a bug that could have potentially harmed someone. It turned out that there wasn't. There was an error in the testing, and it wasn't. So I didn't do anything wrong. But for that week, my stress was so overwhelming. I think I lost like ten pounds in a week. And I remember being huddled over the toilet, thinking I was going to throw up from the stress because I had, I had let my coworkers down. I could have potentially hurt someone. And while none of that was true, the stress was overwhelming. And the thought I had at the time was, if I do this for the next 25 years, I'm going to be dead. I'm going to die of stress. I'm going to have like hypertension or a heart attack or something like that. So I Googled, how do I retire early? And uh, up came these blogs like J.D. Roth from Get Rich Slowly and Mr. Money Mustache, whose uh, co-working space we're sitting in right now. Life has come full circle. And I started reading these blogs, and it was about these two guys who claimed they had retired in their 30s. And the first thought I had was, what kind of shit have I landed on? <laughs> this, this must be some kind of scam where they're going to try to sell me some multi-level marketing thing, like when is the sales pitch coming? But I, I started reading through the blog, especially Mr. Money Mustache, who went into a lot of numbers, like the 4% rule and the math behind early retirement. And then I'm like, well, I don't want to live off $24,000 a year like Pete does. That's too little. But this is pretty much just a simple math problem. So at that time, I did not have enough money to retire. But thankfully, I'd always been a saver. And there's a story behind that, too. We'd always been pretty frugal. Um, that was probably the craziest time of our life where we weren't being frugal. 
So we pretty much pivoted. We sold our house. We moved to a much cheaper home. And I set out a plan to retire. Uh, I figured it would take me about four years or 1,500 days. And I th- I had always enjoyed writing. So I thought, why don't I document this journey on the internet? It'll keep me honest and it'll be fun. Yeah, uh, that happened. And I made my number about a year earlier than I planned, not due to any genius on my own part, but due to a, a great stock market. But uh, that's it. Now I quit. And let's see. I don't even remember when I quit. Yeah, it was 2013. But I made my goal in 2012. So the, the money is easy. The emotions, not easy, but simple. The emotions that go around it are a little bit more difficult. Congratulations. Yeah. That is an awesome story. Yeah, and thank you. for the people that are wondering out there, um, you you do have a blog. and We will get into numbers, um, what you're making from the blog and a lot of the details since that's what a lot of my audience um, is used to. Sure. Um, but I am super fascinated with like the emotional part. Um, it's a simple math problem, right? Like when you get down to it, it's a simple yeah. math problem. So can you just hit at a high level, the 4% rule, and then I'll provide some links. You have some excellent blog posts um, where you outline it a little bit more detailed, but yeah, what what's the bottom line? Yeah. So th- there's a lot of moving parts to the 4% rule, but at a real high level, what it says is once you've accumulated enough money to live on 4% of it your first year, and then after that, it adjusts for inflation. But So, for example, my number was I need $40,000 a year to live on. Therefore, I would need $1 million to retire. Uh, after that, it gets ratcheted up for inflation, but that is the very basics of the 4% rule. So I accumulated my $1 million in April 2012, I think. Okay. And for people that want to go deeper, you documented this whole process on your blog. Um, you list your net worth, you have, you know, the benchmarks that you hit. And I'm, I'm curious cause it's funny to talk about money in certain circles. <laughs> it sure is, right? Um, it's the most taboo subject in the world. Right. And even, you know, around here, uh, a lot of us have, uh, maybe like sort of a freer schedule. We're like-minded folks. Um, but even then it's like slightly awkward cause we're talking about money and it's just yeah. taboo. So did you get pushback from like family or friends or anything like that? Yeah, I, I, I was anonymous and uh, eventually a story went viral and everyone found out what it was. And then it got kind of weird. But the thing I found is money is so taboo then. It, well, so I'll back up a second. When the story went public, uh, our picture showed up on the front page of Yahoo and my initial reaction was like, oh shit. And I was still working at the time. I'm like, but then I'm like, no one reads Yahoo News. Like, who reads that anymore? But then it turns out everyone reads Yahoo News. We started getting all these text messages like 10 minutes later saying, hey, you're on Yahoo. You've got a, a million dollars. Like, holy shit. Why don't you tell us about any of this? And I'm like freaking out. I'm like, oh, my God, my job's going to find out. But then I thought maybe this will be good. The whole reason I, I've i been so open with money is – my goal was to kind of bring it out into the open because if we all talked about it, I think we'd be a lot healthier. We could start helping each other out and not trying to hide behind expensive cars to disguise our insecurities and and everything that goes along with not having money. So I thought it would be a good exercise to be public with it. And it turned out um, we haven't helped. I've helped people, but no close people, no friends or family really. I found they don't care or they just feel weird about asking about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I get random, I get random emails from strangers on the internet and mail, which is kind of weird, a- asking me for money. And I won't give you money, but I will give you help. And no one wants to take me up on that. They just want the easy answer. So I'd rather teach them to fish than give them the fish. What was your original question? I think I went way off on a tangent. No, uh, that that's perfect. Um, it was about just talking about money and being public. And- yeah. You know, I've got one other crazy story about that. When when I was about 12 or 13, money is always fascinating to me and kind of because I didn't grow up with it. So I, yeah, there was a lot of insecurity in some scary moments as a kid where my dad would be laid off. So when I was 12 or 13, I I went to my mom. I'm like, hey, mom, how much money does dad make? And uh, the whole reason I wanted to know this was I was just curious. I wanted to know how much I needed to make as an adult and I was curious about what they did with their money. And then my mom gets this look on her face. She's like, that is private. You cannot ask those questions. You better not ask that again. And she got all mad about it. I'm like, oh, okay. So 
then plan B was to sneak down to the file cabinet in the basement and look at their paycheck stubs, which I did, and I, I eventually found out that way. But then the funny thing was, a couple months after that, my mom's like, hey, come downstairs, we need to have a conversation. I'm like, oh, okay, mom, what's going on? I'm kind of scared. She's like, let's talk about the birds and the bees. And I'm like, hey, mom, I found out about all this stuff through the kid on the playground. I know what to do. I know how to be safe. So uh, I'm just going to go back outside and play. I promise I'll be I'll be good with that stuff. So my mom was okay talking to me about sex, but not about money. And I'm the exact opposite with my kids. And part of them might be because I have two girls. I'm like, oh, our younger one is like, well, how do babies get made? Um, well, mom and dad love each other, and then a baby is there. Um, but how does it get there? Am I is that going to happen to me? I'm like. Uh, I went off on a big tangent there, but it's funny how my yeah. mom was eager to talk to me about, about sex, but not money. I think that's a little bit backwards. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. Um, I think like from my perspective, uh, I talk about internet marketing a lot and certain people do share like their income levels, but they rarely share like the net worth. So yeah, yeah I think it's interesting and I haven't personally thought about it, but um, just understanding how the how the world works i would be slightly concerned <laughs> with some of the things that you mentioned um and just one thing you mentioned in that uh answer you were talking about you know your car so what, what are you driving these days you said you know some people hide their net worth and get fancy cars and stuff so what, what are you driving yeah i have a 2003 honda element which i did buy new which in retrospect i would not do again but we've kept the same car it has almost two hundred thousand miles on it I change the oil. I perform my own maintenance on it. Um, the other car we have is, is a 2010 Mazda 5. And I'm a car guy. Like, I'm obsessed with cars. I would love to have a Tesla. Although I'd buy a used Model S at this point. You can, you can get them for like 25000 now. But my two cars work fine. And uh, now that I don't have a job, I spend most of my time walking or riding a bicycle. So we have two cars and we barely need one. So my Tesla dreams will probably be a long way off. Maybe we should do like some kind of ride share for the HQ here. It has been discussed and, oh, yeah. and it might happen. I would absolutely love that. Uh, Sounds interesting. Cheap old Model S get back and forth to the airport. Yeah, I'd, I'd be game for that. <laughs> so let's talk about your website some and, and transition into that. So okay. tell us about it. You, you were like, hey, I'm going to document this journey, have a little accountability, even though it was anonymous. So how did it go it started when you started? Yeah, I'll back up a second and tell you why I did this whole thing in the first place. Uh, when I was in high school, I really enjoyed writing, but then I saw how much a journalist makes and uh, it, it wasn't that great. And that was even before the internet was a thing. So it, that would have been a terrible decision being a journalist probably. Um, but I always had it in the back of my mind that I'd really like to write and I'd really like an outlet for it. So when I figured out that I would do this early retirement thing back in October of 2012, I'm like, y you know, here's my outlet. These two guys are blogging, J.D. Roth and Mr. Money Mustache, but there's no one else is really doing this. If I would have just hit up Google, I probably would have found the other. Right now, there's like a billion retirement blogs, early retirement blogs, but even then there was a lot. So thankfully, I didn't hit up Google or else I probably would have been discouraged. So I, I, I thought I should document my journey and document all my finances because, number one, I think this is something that should be talked about. Uh, money is a silly thing. We should all get past it and move on to talking about better things. And number two, I thought it would keep me honest. If I did something stupid, I'd have to document it, and then the Internet could call me out. So maybe it would help me not correct my behavior but prevent me from doing stupid money things in the first place. And, uh, yeah, I thought it would be fun to show the world this and kind of try to inspire other people as well, which I have. I, I Not nearly the reach as some of these others, but once in a while I'll get an email saying, hey, thank you, I saw your blog and it's caused me to change the course of my life. So I'm really thankful for that. And funny thing, I was chatting with someone earlier today who I've done some business with. She's out of St. Louis. I didn't know her before um, our like business transaction. So I was like, yeah, I'm interviewing someone later. So we need to jet. I mentioned, I was like, oh, you know, Mr. Money Mustache and like it's this co-working space. So it's pretty cool. It's like pretty cool people that I get to hang out with sometimes. And she was like, do you know Mr. 1500? And I was <laughs> Are you like, serious? yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And she Chris, was like, okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, she was like Carl and Mindy and blah, blah, blah. And uh, yeah, so she's a little bit of a uh, 
fangirl stalker uh, just normal <laughs> yeah, she's yeah, yeah. fine she's gonna watch this so she's fine farther than you think uh, and i mean how much traffic are you getting these days yeah i, I get about a hundred thousand page views and uh one other thing i'll say about the blog is i never i wrote for an audience of one i never thought anyone would ever read my nonsense i'm still very much an amateur I go back and read my early posts. It's like, oh my God, this is like 13 level. You didn't even get there, there, and there, right? What the heck's the matter with you? So I'm very thankful that people read it. And I'm very thankful that some people have actually gotten something out of it because it's always been my own personal journey and I always meant it for myself. And uh, yeah, I still have to pinch myself that uh, it's very bizarre when people come up and tell me or stories like this. It's just... uh, it's surreal. I didn't read much until I was prepping for the interview here, but I think your writing is, it's funny in a, in, in a dry way that I really appreciate. <laughs> so uh, like, do you have any specific inspiration um, or I guess role models that you looked up to as writers where you're like, I, I kind of like that. I want to write like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you, there's two things that immediately come to mind. And then first one is Pete, Mr. Money Mustache. I remember reading one of his posts where he's talking about, uh, I, I don't remember what he's talking about, but what he wrote is like, um, he said something about being the person who farts in a quiet room. And when, when I first saw that, I'm like, wow, I can't believe anyone actually wrote that. But then I thought, this is awesome. This huge blogger just writes stuff like this and he uses like F-bombs and profanity. So he was one because he gave me permission to write in my own voice, which often includes stuff about farts and sometimes profanity. But the other thing is just to find your own voice and write that. Because if you try to be someone else, you're not going to write as well and it's not going to come off as genuine. So you just got to be yourself. And that dry, stupid humor that I use is like the purest expression of my personality, which I don't think comes out much in my real life. If you see me like that, I might have had, if you see me talking like I write in my blog, I've either had a couple beers or I'm very comfortable with you because I think we all put up these facades and that's mine, a little bit of insecurity. So the blog is the purest form of my personality. And if anyone's thinking about doing this, just write however you are. Hopefully you're not super boring and super dry, but I don't think most people are. Everyone has something interesting to say and there's 7 billion people in the world and half, over half of those people are on the internet so write, write in your own voice and your audience will find you. There's certain things you have to do to promote and do that, but just be yourself. It's the simplest and kind of cliche advice, but I think it's also the most important. Very good. And as far as like revenue, so you mentioned you're getting about 100,000 visitors. That, that's per month, I take it? Yeah, per month. And then revenue wise, can you tell us like uh, how much you're making and then yeah, the sure. different methods that it's coming in? Yeah, I never really set out to monetize the blog, and I'm, I'm still not very good at it. Um, there's lots of things I could do that I don't do, like sponsored posts and uh, trying to sell certain products. The two things I do are, number one, ads, and those generate between – they're widely variable. They pick up a lot around December because of the shopping season, but they're usually between 800 and maybe $1,400 a month. And the other thing I do are affiliates. So, And the only one I do right now is personal capital because I think that's a great way to look at your financial picture. I don't use their service, but I do that one. And if someone signs up for that and they have a $100,000 net worth, I get a $100 commission from there. So the blog revenue is widely, um, one month it'll be 1000 It probably maxes out at like 2000 a month right now. Okay. So I, I never set out to really do that. Like I said, it was always meant to be my own journal. The first three years, I made a total of $100 for the blog. But then I, I still like making money, even though I'm retired. I don't mind having... Uh, it's still fun. I like the challenge of making money. I think Warren Buffett had a quote, like Warren Buffett is, has $65 billion and he has all the money he needs, but it, it's kind of like a game and that's what it is to me. So I feel kind of silly leaving money on the table. I, I can have some ads that aren't intrusive. I don't do things like pop-ups. That kind of stuff drives me nuts. But it's also very good if you do that. You'll get build your email list, which is very important. So I do the minimal amount, which still generates a little bit of extra spare change to go on vacations or uh, pay for my daughter's braces, which came up this month. Man, braces are expensive. Holy shit. $6,000. They were 2000 when I was a kid. Wow. Should have been an orthodontist. Oh, well. Yeah, no, no kidding. <laughs> Big tangent there. 
They are, yeah, they're super expensive. My <laughs> wife is doing uh, the, uh, hopefully she won't be upset. She doesn't watch or listen to any of this stuff, but uh, yeah, she's doing the Invisalign type type deal. So sure, teeth are expensive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I was going to say, there are people with my same traffic that probably make 10 times as much. So if I wanted to sell certain services or do other affiliates, create a course, I could be making far much more money. But then- it would change the calculus of the blog too. And the reason I'm doing it, the whole, I do it to amuse myself. And at that point, it would be more like a business and a job. I don't need any more money. Therefore, I'm not going to do it. But if you are thinking about starting a blog and you do want to make money from it, certainly there are other ways to generate money and more money than I'm doing. Definitely. And I think, I mean, you know, you approached it in a pure way. You know, you were writing for yourself. You weren't trying to pander to a specific audience or pander to like affiliate um, or companies that would allow you to be an affiliate where you're like making uh, decisions that compromise like what you're trying to do. Yeah. And I think probably, and you kind of mentioned it earlier, so I know you agree, like that probably helped like get the right people in and people to, to trust you, the audience to trust you and that sort of thing. Yeah. If people see you're genuine and that's another thing I learned from Mr. Money Mustache, like he cannot be bought if someone offered him infinite amount of money to do something. If he didn't really believe in it, he wouldn't do it. And I see it firsthand because, like I said, we're sitting in his co-working space right now. So it, I'm not saying that these services aren't good. I think there's plenty of them that are good and could generate income and could help people. But uh, I'm just too lazy to spend the time to research them because if I'm going to promote these to other people, I'm going to spend the time to sign up for – X real estate company and put money into it and let it sit there for a year and, and uh, see what it does. Cause I can't honestly promote something unless I've had, I have vetted it myself. Yep. And I mean, you probably get pitches all the time. I have a, a modest uh, YouTube channel and basically I get an email per day where someone's yeah. like, Hey, will you try out our product? You could sign up as an affiliate. And I'm like, I don't even care. Right. But if you, if you had to, if you really wanted to, if you pay me a thousand bucks, I'll make a seven minute video for you, you know, <laughs> because I'm like, I could, I yeah. could do that. You know, it's not so bad. Do you get pitched all the time like that? Yeah. It's funny you have that. And I put a goofy guest post policy on my blog and uh, it's kind of similar to your thing there. I say, if you pay me $10,000, I'll promote your product with a post for up to 24 hours. But after that, I reserve the full right to take it down. And I reserved her write whatever I want before and after the post and intro and outro saying that I do not believe in this product. I do not support it. At this point, I am selling out for $10,000. So take this as you may. It, uh, it's accomplished what I wanted because no one has taken me up on that offer. <laughs> but if it's a good product, if I think it'll help someone, uh, I'll promote it for free. And I've done that many times. I don't need any more money, but it's nice to be able to help people and get a when you get a nice email saying, hey, thank you, you've helped me, it brings me to tears. Actually, I'm not embarrassed to say that. So because um, you can change lives and that's uh, more important than another dollar in my pocket. Indeed. And uh, are you good? Do you want to take a break, get more water or anything? No, I think I'm pretty good. OK. So, you know, speaking of that, you know, you've accumulated a good amount of money. You're making like money on the side from the website and probably other couple other things you got going on, too. We talked earlier about like happiness a little bit. Sure. So how, how do you bridge like now you realize, OK, have enough money. Now, what are you working on? You know, and yeah. let's talk about the happiness stuff. Yeah. And the happiness is so important. Before I get into that, there's uh, something else I want to mention, too. When I discovered this whole FI thing, and even before that, I was so hell-bent on accumulating money. Uh, just because, like I said before, I had financial insecurity from some of my childhood. But I realized, looking back now, it was kind of silly. The best example is between, or the worst example, depending on how you want to phrase it, is we bought this house to flip in 2013. Not to flip, but to fix up. So we bought this crummy house, and I just spent, and I was working a full-time job. So I would work for 40 hours a week, then I'd work on this house for 40 hours a week. But I had kids too, and I didn't want to sacrifice time with them. So I'd wake up like at 4.30 in the morning and start working on this house, being careful not to wake up my neighbors. And uh, and I had the blog too, so I'd wake up like at 4 or 5 and go to bed like 11 o'clock at night. So I was hell-bent on this silly journey just to accumulate this money. And and I see people saying things on other blogs like, like oh, I only have 500 days or 600 days until I can retire. I'm like, no, you're doing an 
all wrong. You never know what could happen. You could be dead in five or 600 days. So uh, the point I'm making with all this is you have to find ways to find happiness. And every single day you have to appreciate, even if you've got a crummy job with a crummy boss, you have to either change that or find ways to appreciate your life like every moment because it goes by too fast and uh, you can't wish your days away in favor of some future payoff. That's just the wrong way to live. And please rephrase your original question because I went off on a big tangent right there. The goal originally was to accumulate money, but yeah. now the goal is really like um, making sure you're happy in your day-to-day -day life, whether or not you had a job. Yeah. Probably. So I think you, you sort of answered it, but if you want to elaborate a little deeper. Yeah. Early retirement can be a tricky thing because uh, a lot of us were determined we probably had stressful jobs like software. And uh, Doug, you mentioned you worked on weekends and I worked heavy duty hours too. I had a couple months where I worked a lot of 80 hour weeks. And uh, so all of a sudden you stop working and you've got this big vacuum in your life. And I've heard people who have done this early retirement thing that have actually gone back to work. And this goes back to a little bit about what I said before, cultivate a happy life beforehand and you won't be left at a loss when you quit your job. The main thing I found when I quit is all these little activities that, that I would try to squeeze in between the job and all this other stuff I was doing expanded. So for example, I would squeeze in a workout like for 20 minutes, maybe three days a week. And that would always be the first thing to fall off. But now I sit there and I bike up into the mountains, so I'm out on my bike for two or three hours. I can do a weight workout for an hour and a half. All these things I, I did before have expanded. I say, look at how your weekends look, and uh, if your weekends are super busy, you're running around by Sunday comes, you're exhausted, and you're not looking forward to going back to work because you didn't finish half the stuff you wanted to do, you're probably a pretty good retirement for, you're probably a pretty good candidate for early retirement. On the other hand, if your weekends are watching TVs and your hands are orange from Cheeto dust, I would say maybe you want to stay at your job or cultivate your hobbies or find stuff to do. But yeah, it all comes down to happiness. And that's a deep part of thing because I think a lot of people think we know what makes us happy. A lot of people think this new gigantic pickup truck or Lexus or whatever car is going to make us happy, but it really doesn't. It provides for short-term happiness, but trying to find deep fulfillment and contentment in life is a whole other thing. And, uh, I happen to love creating stuff. I, I like to build things. I probably work harder in retirement than I worked at a job. That's what makes me happy. I'm working on a house right now. I'm working on a web comic. So I use the w word work a lot, but I'm not working for a paycheck. Some of this stuff does pay, but I'm working for happiness. My paycheck is happiness. And if it happens, if there happens to be a side effect of getting paid for it, just like the blog I write because I love it, uh, that's great, but that's not the reason I'm doing it. And I think um, we may have said this specific thing when we were out hiking a couple couple weeks ago and I completely lost my train of thought. It's funny that happens. I describe myself as like a busy body. So I will find yes. a project. So if we're like on a desert island and there's, um, let's say there's plenty of fish and food and like we don't have to worry about water, like things are fine. Like we even uh -huh. find a shelter. Imagine Gilligan's Island, right? So we, we show up on <laughs> Gilligan's Island we'll still like come up with some project. We're like, you know what? I think uh, maybe this hut, uh, maybe we could have like a sitting area out front and then you find yourself, you know, gathering bamboo or something. So do you describe yourself as a busybody type? Oh, absolutely. And that would be a great question. Like what would you, what would you do if you're stranded on a desert island? Like uh, just thinking about it now, I would try to find some way to make the sand into cement. We'd come up with a new cement product. I would cut down the trees. Some of them, I like trees, so I wouldn't cut them all down. But we'd be making like epic tree forts. And we'd probably try to build like a house out of trees. Um, yeah, I it, going on vacation actually makes me depressed because uh, I like work. Um, sitting on a beach all day would be uh, my worst nightmare. There's a quote from, I think, George Bernard Shaw, who was a playwright that said, my idea of hell is a permanent vacation. And I'm totally on board with that. My my ideal vacation is something like what uh, Pete, Mr. Money Mustache does, where he goes to some nice place that he hasn't been before and does work. Like I know he went to Hawaii and built a bathroom for someone and uh, he does trips like that. And that's my ideal of a trip where you, you work pretty hard, maybe in the mornings, and then you have a beer in the afternoon or go for a hike like we did, blow off some steam. So I think uh, work is fundamental to happiness for humans. It's just 
finding out what work makes you happy and what kind of what kind of busybody work makes you happy. I, the, my worst fear is not having something to do. Like just thinking about it makes me crazy. I'd, I think I tend to uh, err on the side of making myself too busy right now. <laughs> I'm rebottling a basement. I'm trying to push through a couple inventions. I'm working on a webcomic, working on a blog, raising two children, and uh, designing this fancy deck for my house. And uh, yeah, I've got more than enough to keep me busy. Retirement is not boring. <laughs> so what is it like an average day or a week look like for you? Because I know some days are going to be totally different. Yeah, I, I would say there is no such thing as an average day. I, I guess there might be something as an average season. So in the summer, uh, I have two daughters and they're out of school. So I like to maximize the time I spend with them. And so we, we ride bikes. I'm working on a birdhouse and bat house business with my older daughter. She wants to sell these things online and make them. And with the younger one this summer, we're going to be building a playhouse. It, again, I can't stop working. So I like to try to Get, to get them to do some work. So my younger daughter was like, I want an art studio and a playhouse for the backyard. I'm like, okay, I could do that, but I'm going to teach you how to build too. So you're going to learn how to use a drill. Under, although under my supervision, she's not going to get injured like I do here, protection, eye protection. But I'm like, we're going to build some stuff, but we are going to build it. I am not going to build it for you. So in the summer, it's stuff like that with the daughters. Uh, we'll go on road trips to visit family. And in the winter, it's widely variable. Uh, we went for a hike. I'm doing this interview with you right now. I help run this co-working space. I'm a part owner of this. So I help run this. Uh, I interact with members. I'm working on an invention with a couple other members. I work on my house. But every day is a, a little bit different. What I do try to do is the first thing I do in the morning is put all my goals on a Google Keep document, what I want to get done, try to organize it effectively if I need to go out of the house. I'm going to go here, here, and here. So I try to plot everything effectively. So I'm not in, on the car frequently, but uh, that's a hard question because every day is so different. And uh, this brings up kind of a philosophical thing. Before I quit my job, I was so afraid of uncertainty. I, I was so worried that I wouldn't be on this routine and I wouldn't be doing this between eight to five. By now, I think the uncertainty is the best part of life. Like, okay, today I'm going to work on the basement, but if a friend calls me and he needs help with that, I can drop that and go help my friend put Eric put siding on his house or or, or do whatever and random interactions with people here at the co-working space. So uh, the uncertainty is really good. And uh, I went off on another big tangent here, but uh, perfect. yeah, every day is a little bit different, but it's great. You learn to embrace that and you learn to go with things that come up. Someone will say, hey, let's go for a hike on Mount Sanita. Okay, sounds good. I don't have anything to do for the next three hours. And uh, that's really good. I will say there are core activities for life and those are dropping the girls off, picking them up and exercise. Before I retired, I weighed over 180 pounds. I had hypertension, uh, this big gut, and I still have a little one now, but now I'm high 150s. So I'm in much better shape. So that's become a core part of my daily routine. So no matter what, I find a way to fit that in. I'll drop anything else off my schedule while the girls are at school to make sure I get my workout in. So. And I found, I, I guess, we'll, we'll talk about the definition of retirement. I don't know if people would consider me retired since yeah. I do things kind of like you. However, I lost a pretty good amount of weight. So I was like in the high 170s. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, from reading your blog a little bit and researching for this, like I'm, I'm around the same weight I was in high school. And yeah. I think you dropped basically around the same, right? So yeah. you're in great shape now. Yeah, Doug, you're very fit. Um, I, I haven't seen you with a t-shirt on, but uh, we've been all bundled up for wintertime, yeah. but you're, you're a very fit person. Well, one thing people often say about early retirement is, uh, I'll have no meaning in my life. A friend told me this. I'm so worried about dying young, but like I would have died if I would have stayed at my job. All the stress and my lack of time to work out and lack of willpower. You can only take so much stuff thrown at you during the day. So when you have nothing to do, you can have the willpower to do a really good workout. So, And a callback from uh, something you mentioned before with the fasting. So I used to go out to lunch with my friends, right? Yeah. And then we eat too much, right? I'm like, ah, I don't want to, I'm not going to bring it home or whatever. So I like eat the whole plate of pasta or a giant sandwich. And then, yes, for the rest of the afternoon, I'm like a zombie for like three hours because <laughs> of all the carbs. Plus you spent whatever... 10 to 20 bucks on lunch, which now, I mean, well, we're, we're fasting, which is super economic. I just find like the work and the lunch 
and then the whole the whole thing was like completely unhealthy stressful my cholesterol was higher now it's like 180 you know yeah. so anyway the health benefits are like well, i was going to say immeasurable but you actually can measure cholesterol so that's <laughs> yeah you can measure cholesterol weight and hypertension pretty easily actually so yeah i'm far healthier than i ever was and you are too it's a lot easier to put like intermittent fasting. I'm going to say right now, I wouldn't have been able to do it working because uh, I wouldn't be able to take the stress in the morning and I just would have, I wouldn't have been able to push through the hunger. Mm -hmm. So, and now I can eat till, not eat till 12 or one sometimes. It's uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing for people that want to try it. It's a little tough at first, but like once you work your way into it, it feels great. Yeah, it's great. And supposedly in it, weight loss benefits, but supposedly there's other benefits too. your body repairs itself and. What's the longest uh, fast you've done? I've done 24 hours. Like I've had dinner and then the next day I intend to eat at noon, but I'm not hungry at noon. So I just push through it and don't eat till dinner. Okay. So uh, 24 hours. I've never tried any of the long-term fast. You know, how about yourself? Have you ever tried like a week-long fast or any of that? No, exactly what you said where I actually compensate with uh, coffee. So okay. I'll like drink too much coffee, which leads to just horrific like uh, – <laughs> just terrible terrible breath so but so yeah that's what we're sitting so far apart <laughs> but um i compensate with coffee but yeah a couple of times i've done like the 20 23 and a half hours or something like that yeah. so and yeah it's weird you make it through and i'm like i maybe could have like gone to bed and like made it you know 36 but yeah there's no i don't have a big driver to do that so i was yep. like all right yeah I'll it kind of comes uh superpower too because you build up that willpower muscle and you find that you're able to push through other stuff i can push myself harder on a workout or make myself do other things that perhaps i wouldn't have been able to just because my willpower has grown yeah and i used to be i would be a little bitch if i got hungry and more like at the airport or something yeah. like that yeah. like i would just melt down like a kid you know so yeah. this is really good because i'm like no i'm good i could just let's keep going i, I don't care if, if even if we don't eat for a couple hours yeah so. it's nice i've had that same situation where i get to the airport and i'm hungry and then you look at the like that burrito is like 15 bucks you know i'll just wait till i land and uh it gets up the cheaper at the grocery store so yeah yeah good on so many levels we could have a whole talk about this and fasting yeah and then we'll just make ourselves hungry and then we'll like want to go eat and have beer <laughs> yeah. let's go back to like some of the uh re retirement uh sort of topics so from your definition or oh, i'll just let you define it so retirement how, how do you define it in our situation here yeah or I think, your situation not yeah. ours but so I actually Googled the word retirement and the definition that, that came up is, I think, to cease doing work. And I, I hate the word retirement for that because I haven't ceased doing anything. It has changed and I'm doing things on my own term, but I, I work more than ever. I just do it for, I, I just do it because I love it. And uh, some of it pays money, some of it does not, but it is definitely not to cease work. So retirement in our definition would be, uh, <laughs> that's all. It's such a hard question. I guess I would say I am not retired because retired means to stop doing something, but uh, maybe financially independent, but that doesn't, you could say you're financially independent, but that doesn't connotate the uh, stop work part. So I don't know, fun ploy, uh, <laughs> do, do whatever the hell I want. Someone needs to come up with a new term. Have you ever thought about what would be an accurate term to describe our, our situation? I think I, I'm sure I heard it from some other smarter person, but like a work optional or the work that you're doing is optional and yeah. you, you have choices. Yep. Something like that. Because you do some stuff that's making money and then there's some other stuff that you're just doing for fun. Yeah. And I should also disclose that my wife works and that was a whole other weird situation. She has a more formal employment agreement, but uh, she does it because she loves it too. I tell her. Almost weekly, if you don't like this anymore, stop. Don't do it anymore. She's like, no, I really get something out of this. So, And we have kids, so I need a activity that I really enjoy while they're mm -hmm. in school. So, But uh, yeah, a good, a great passive income source is a spouse that works. That is great. I have the same thing. So yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's good passive benefits. for us at least. <laughs> yeah. And um, hopefully, yeah, if you asked 
M Mindy is uh, my real estate agent, Carl's wife. So um, hopefully this week she was uh, in good spirits after working with us. We're kind of, we're high maintenance. I'll put it that way. And then I'm going to hopefully have Mindy on the show. I didn't realize she was such a prominent podcaster until a little bit after. I, I think I listened to like one or two episodes and then it was like, oh, you're that Mindy. I was like, oh, whatever. And then I was like, oh. Oh, this is kind of a big deal. <laughs> yeah. And, and by the way, I, you are not high maintenance at all. I have some stories I could tell you, which I will not say on the air because I don't want to hurt any feelings. But if you think you're high maintenance, uh, nah, you're not. <laughs> yeah. I'm like just walking in, apologizing constantly. But that's kind of my kind of my style. I don't want to I don't want to be in position for anyone. You know? Yeah, so. I understand. You're thoughtful. <laughs> person. So sticking with the retirement ideas, did you have like a hard time at the very end where you were like, ah, like we see the math, but what about the risk in the future, the unforeseen just future, the consequences that you may just have no clue about? Yeah, it's interesting. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm stupid, but from a financial standpoint, I never worried about anything. And I probably should have had because I, we didn't keep super good track of our spending and my $1 million in savings would not have been enough to retire for the 4% rule. You, uh, I think most people vastly underestimate the amount of money they spend. It. We didn't vastly underestimate it, but we did underestimate it. But at the time, I did not worry about money at all. And part of it was I, I knew I could just go back to work. I was a software guy, and I still get emails multiple per day about jobs, which I don't ask for. I don't know where these things come from, but I'm I'm never going to go back to the go back to a formal software job. The emotional part was very difficult, though. Like I said, I made my number a, a year before I stopped working because uh, I had worked really, really hard and built up a career for the previous 20 years. And just to let all that go, you've got the, the sunk cost, all the time you spent learning these programming languages and all the time you spent working your way up, you've got this body of knowledge. So you're very valuable to your organization. Like, uh, I designed the infrastructure that our thing sat on in addition to being a coder. And, and I felt kind of kind of bad, and that was probably selfish because no one is irreplaceable unless you're Elon Musk. But, uh, yeah, it was very hard, and I'd known these people. <laughs> Often I don't think it's a good idea to become good friends with your coworkers, but I was, and I, I like these people a lot. And by leaving my job, I was going to leave a big part of my life behind. And I was worried about that vacuum too. Like, am I going to be bored after I leave this job? Am I going to sit around and really re regret this? The thing is too, once I left my job, I probably wouldn't be able to go back to that one because I had a clearance, which would have lapsed after I quit. So once I closed that door, I there was probably no going back. So yeah, the emotional part was very difficult. I kind of had to, I say, kick my ass over the edge and just do it and see what happened. Do you remember like the first day that you didn't go to work? <laughs> yeah, I actually do because my life kind of came full circle that day. So I remember my last day was a Thursday and that Friday I had, uh, I had some friends over and they were all friends I met through the early retirement community, like a couple of them were readers from the blogs who I became friends with. And uh, and Mr. Money Mustache himself, Pete came over to my house. So it was weird. Like one of the people who gave me this whole idea of early retirement was now at my house on my first official day of retirement. It was kind of poetic and beautiful in a way. So yeah, that was the first thing I did. I think that was April 13th. Um, yeah, April 13th or April 14th of 2013. I'd have to go back and look at a calendar, but I took a picture of it too. And then it was, uh, let's get back to work and start working on life. So I did not take any downtime, no decompression. I uh, moved right back into other things. Doing stuff. That's pretty cool because I think that would be really tough. I mean, I know... I guess people are like parents' age that retired and, you know, people they sit on the couch and they start watching TV and they don't get up and, um, you know, their health declines and like yeah. they never really yeah. get to enjoy the retirement, you know? Yeah. It's really sad. Right. Cause if you, if you think about it from a physiological standpoint, our bodies are in decline after the age of like 28 or something like that. You don't see many professional tennis players still ranking high, especially in their late thirties. So, and you might not notice it cause you were never a top athlete, but, uh, yeah, if you wait till 65, then your body's in much more decline. And uh, I, I want to enjoy life while I still can. I want to go hiking with you and snowshoeing. I don't know if I'll be able to, to do that stuff when I'm 
65, uh, people are always so afraid, even people who have accumulated the money. But what I always tell them is, uh, you know, there's always that chance your fear might come true. You might run out of money, but what you are going to run out of money, what you are going to run out of is life. You are going to die. And that's for sure. The money part may or may not happen. And if it does, you might be able to do something about it, like go back to work or move to a cheaper cost of living area, but you will die and you should consider that first before the money issue. Don't don't be stupid with the money, be smart with it, but it's hard to envision death when you're 40 and everything's going well, all your body functions still work, but uh, yeah, you, you got to think long-term about these things and really, uh, really consider what your body is going to be like at 65. And uh, yeah, I don't know, I was at a, one thing that stuck with me is I went to the Berkshire Hathaway conference with uh, with Warren Buffett and some young kid go, comes up and asks a question. I think he was from China. He was like, I'm in my 20s, blah, blah, blah. What should I do? And I don't remember the first part of what Warren Buffett said, but Warren Buffett said, you know, I would love to be your age again. If I could trade bodies with you, I'd give you every single <laughs> cent I had. And a good thought exercise, I think, is always to extrapolate. So, of course, he's like that because he's almost dead. The guy's like 89 now, I think. But uh even when you're when he was sixty or seventy, I'll bet he would have given the same answer. So, th so think about that. Money is real important when you're young, but time is most important when you're older. We don't value time as much as we should when we're young. And was there like a, a switch in your mind where, you, like, you like embodied that and you were like, oh, you know what? Time is way like I can earn more money, but we can't get back this time. Yeah, well, I think about it every day. I don't think there was one specific moment, but that particular thing has always stuck with me. And perhaps I think a little bit different than most, but people are, when they talk about this early retirement thing, people are like, well, I want to live it up now because what happens if I die young? What happens if I die when I'm 60? But I think that's the perfect justification for early retirement. Like, I don't want to work to buy all this crap. I'd rather be free. If I knew I was going to die when I was 60, I would sure as hell try to retire even sooner, like as soon as possible to maximize my time. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, I guess I'm weird too. And actually I'm definitely weird, but I think the same thing and I have for years where it's just like every, everyone is definitely going to die and you don't know when it is. Yeah. And, um, not that we're out there doing crazy stuff or risky things or anything like that, but it's just like appreciate what you have going on. Yeah, your time is your greatest resource. Don't ever forget that. It's not money. Do you have any tips for people that um, they want to go down a similar path? And um, I kind of want to focus on the expenses area. Sure. So, because I know you said you maybe weren't tracking as well. My wife and I were pretty meticulous. We've tracked like pretty damn close for the okay. past like four years. But um, yeah, how do, you, how do you approach And You mentioned maybe your family spending 40K or at least at one point in time, uh, the family of four, 40K. So yeah, just talk a little bit about the expenses aspect. Yeah, I, I would say the number one advice for anyone if they're thinking about doing this, and even if they aren't, the number one thing that I think everyone should do is keep track of expenses. You can completely automate that through a service like Mint or Personal Capital, where you punch in your credit card information, and then they track it and they'll categorize it. But I prefer to do it a little bit more manual way. So what I've created is a spreadsheet, and I can give you a link to this, with a Google form that creates a survey. So every time I buy something, I pull out my phone, punch in my expense, it puts it in a spreadsheet, and then I can create pivot tables, which are tables that show exactly where the category where every dollar is going. So I would say do that because it might surprise you. Uh, the thing that surprised me about last year is we spent like $6,000 on restaurants. And I'm always making fun of people going out to eat, but then shit, we spent $6,000. I have no right to be making fun of anyone. And we eat at home pretty much all the time. But anyway, do that because the results might surprise you. And like I said, it's a good exercise for anyone because uh, you might, you just might not realize what you're spending money on. And then after that, the number two thing would be uh, really learn how to invest. It's not that difficult. People want to make you think it's difficult because they're trying to sell some product or their financial advisement services. But investing is not is not that difficult. And it's learning about 401ks, learning about index funds, Roth IRAs, uh, maximizing your tax efficiency and stuff like that. So keep track of your spending. And then once you do that, learn what to do with the excess money that you have. And uh, shit, if you're young, like start now. <laughs> if anyone's listening to this who's in their 20s, like uh, 
Don't wait. The time to do it is now. I will say you, you asked about a switch flipping in my head. When I was in college, my girlfriend dragged me to this financial seminar thing. And I didn't want to go at all. She was a business major. I was biology and chemistry. And I get to this room and I'll never forget it. The first thing I noticed was that everyone was like over 60 and we're here and we're like 20. So at one point, the guy starts talking about compound interest and I'm sitting in the back row eating this cookie and this guy locks eyes with me. I'm like, oh my God, like, what's he going to say? He's like, your advantage is your youth. If you have any excess money, like start saving it now because compound interest will make you rich. I'm like, holy shit. It was like, a, I think a rainbow went over my head and unicorns jumped over the, the building or something like that because uh, that always stuck with me and the cookie probably fell out of my mouth. No, I don't think it was that dramatic, but <laughs> but that taught me to start saving now. And it's interesting because now our net worth is far greater than the amount of money we've earned in our lives. So it's it's much better to have money working for you than to work for money. Indeed. Yeah. And I was, I didn't have the similar cookie drop out of my mouth moment, but for whatever reason, as soon as I got even the co-op job, so I was like 19 or something, yeah. we were eligible for their 401k. I worked at Nortel Networks back yeah. in the day. You probably oh, saw them. Yeah, Nortel. Yeah, until they like, tanked. it was right, right before like yeah. 99. So yeah. they tanked. But yeah, yeah. I, I started saving then and then maxing it out like, even when I was a college or I was paying as much as I, I could afford in there and still pay for school and everything. And then sure. as soon as I got a job, I was maxing out stuff. So did, did you guys do that too? Yeah, we did. I want to ask you a question because, uh, sorry, a little tangent here. There's a yeah. controversial topic that comes up in the personal finance community, whether people are born savers or not. And I think it's true. I definitely think people are born to save or not. And it sounds like you were. And I knew I was too. Like uh, I remember growing up, I was always the one who wanted to put money in the way, how put money in the bank. I was knocking on doors to shovel people's driveway to earn money. And at the same time, my sisters were like, why are you saving this? Just spend the money. And my younger sister was only two years younger than me. So we grew up under pretty much the, the same conditions, but a completely different mindset around money. And still to this day, it, it uh, it's still the same way. So w what do you think about that? Do you think people are born to save or how did you get those values? I think... I don't necessarily think it, people are born to save and I think they can change what they're doing because yes. I've had some phases where I had like some credit card debt right when I got out of school with my first job and bought a house. Another story that uh, was a terrible purchase in 2005, whoa. which you know what happened after that. Yeah, we that. know what happened then. Um, so for me, I, I was similar. Uh, I remember asking my dad, I was like, Hey, I want to get a CD player. And he was like, sure. If you get it, then how are you going to get CDs? Like come up with a plan. And the next day I was pushing the lawnmower around the neighborhood, <laughs> going to, you know, people that had like clearly grass that needed to be cut and then started a, you know, six year career as a lawn maintenance, uh, you know, engineer, I could <laughs> nice. throw the engineer on there, but I saved a ton of money then. And at huh. this point I'm like, if I just would have put that, whatever, $12,000 instead of like paying for college. Yeah, yeah. If I would have put that in like 23 years ago, wow, that that would be great. Yeah. Even despite <laughs> two recessions, including probably the worst, one of the worst ones of all time, right? It's amazing. Like, yeah, yeah crazy. Yeah. So I, I saved a lot of money and to the point where I think I was in, I can't, I guess I was in college, but my older sister, who's like six years older, was buying her first place and I lent her money for the down payment. So like I saved wow. that much money and wow. she had, she was a pharmacist, right? So she had, she yeah. had some decent cash, right? And then, like I said, at some point I was around a bunch of other people who were running credit card debt, buying homes. And I was like, oh, this is like the normal activity. We're going out drinking, having a good time and whatever. And then my wife is much more of a saver. So once we started dating, she kind of reeled me back in. She was yeah. like, what are, you, what are you doing, man? You're crazy. Yeah, what, yeah. Like why? why do you have a payment on this? So I paid off a bunch of stuff and then started hoarding money like like we do now. Yeah, so. yeah, we're, we're money hoarders. <laughs> yeah, so uh, going back, for people that want to get started, get their uh, expenses under control or at least understand where you're spending money and then you can adapt from there. Correct, yes. And do you, it sounds like you're living like not necessarily frugally, but I don't know, is 40K like what you guys are spending these days? I'm not going to count my housing expenses. My And when I say housing, I'm counting my live and flip expenses. Uh, we're fixing up a house right now, which is uh, a whole other deal yeah. um, that we can talk about if you want to, but we don't have to. But uh, 
Yeah, our spending last year was about 60000 14000 of that was, or about 18000 of that was for a mortgage, I believe in keeping a mortgage. So we probably could be close to the $40,000 if I were to cut back. Actually, I think it was 65000 I'm sorry. So if I, we'd still be about $10,000 over, um, even if I paid off my mortgage, which I don't wish to do. Yeah, it, it was still more, we still spend more than I thought we do. And some of that is... Um, discretionary stuff like uh, travel, which we could cut back on. I, I don't drink a whole ton these days, but when I do, it's nice beer, which, uh, man, you could spend $20 on a four-pack of beer now. Holy cow. Shout out to Weldworks, but uh, <laughs> it's good. But if I'm going to drink beer, I'm not going to do it often, but I'm going to have quality stuff. And I, I didn't get to grab, I'm, I'm going to bring you a bottle of beer for sitting with me, but I didn't bring it bring it uh, right now. But do you like Belgian beers okay? Oh, yeah. Every every okay. kind is good. I actually have one of the good things about Pelagian is people bring me good beer, including you, apparently. But someone brought me a West Flavin 12, which for a while was considered the best beer in the world. And it's sitting in my cabinet right now. Have you ever tried that before? I have. So that is for the people that don't know, that's like one of the rarest beers in the world. And um, they don't distribute. You have to go to the Trappist Monastery yeah. in Belgium to get it. And you could only buy a limited amount. So super hard to get in the U.S. Um, in 2012, it was like a special release. Yes. Release. So you remember that? I do. The monastery <laughs> needed a new roof. So they did a sale in the U.S. And there were people camping out at liquor stores to buy a four pack or a six pack of it. Yeah. And it was like a hundred bucks or so. Yeah. And um, I didn't have the, I guess, desire enough to, to snag any then. But one of my friends did. So I bought it from him. So I was going to say, I actually have a bottle. So maybe sometime we can each have our different vintages oh, and, yeah. and taste them. So it's that, definitely good to, uh, to share. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. That's, somebody brought you that. That's a very special beer, man. Yeah. 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 Jake from the space here. I know, right. He was oh, there yeah. on a work trip and he did the road trip up there and brought back six of them. So very cool. One of the questions I wanted you to, uh, think about ahead of time was like a recent purchase that you're like, Hey, this was a good purchase over the last uh, year and a half or something like that. So did you, uh, did you get to think of anything? Uh, there's been a couple of things that I've bought that were surprising. One was uh, I wanted uh, I like to travel as light as possible. So I've got uh, I've got kids who think they need to take all their worldly belongings with them. So we end up with all these suitcases. But I like to travel just from a just from a backpack. And one of the things is if you're going to a cold weather place, you need a jacket. So but it might be hot here, and you might be going to a cold place. So I wanted a jacket that would stuff down. So I bought this New Balance puffer jacket from Amazon. I think it was like $40 and I can squish that thing into a tiny ball and, and fit it in my backpack. So that thing is outstanding and it's warm too. I see people buying these like Patagonia ones that cost like two or 300 bucks. And uh, yeah, this thing is held up just fine. Uh, two other things I made an, an electric bicycle, which is wonderful. So when I first did this thing, I had some some hardcore bike friends telling me, "Oh, so I guess you just don't want to bike? Do you are you going to bike up into the mountains on our <laughs> bike ride with that?" I'm like, "No, dude, it's a substitute for a car. It's a utility item. It's not an exercise thing. I do this instead of driving." So. Uh, that's been great. And that costs a little bit more with a donor bike. I think I spent about fourteen or $1,500 on there. And the third thing I bought for creative purposes was an iPad Pro, which was uh, expensive. I bought a used one with the Apple Pencil. But uh, man, that thing is a beautiful device. If you like to create art, Procreate, like a one-time fee of $10. And uh, yeah, that thing is just outstanding. Um, I love the iPad Pro. So but, Very yeah. cool. And it's a perfect segue. I know you've done these before. Let's hear about the web comic. You mentioned it a couple times. So what's the story? I imagine you're using the iPad with that, right? With a pencil and everything. Yeah, that's correct. It is uh, the URL will be annoyinghumans with a Z.com when it launches. But I used to have this thing on the blog called a Thursday rant, which was the most popular thing. But it was also kind of negative. I would rant about... Uh, Things that, that annoyed me mostly around personal finance, like silly spending. You know, you could buy a solid gold toilet if you want to. It's like $2 million. But anyway, it, I don't think it's solid gold. But uh, but anyway, I found stuff that still annoyed me. Like, geez, you ever drive or go to the airport? You can think of 500 things to get annoyed at. So I needed an outlet to for this where I could just dismiss these things and uh, have some fun with them, I guess, kind of change my mindset. So I create cartoons that that show these things that, that annoy me. I'm trying to think of a good example of one. Eh, bad, bad drivers, people who 
don't know how to travel. We've all been behind the person at the airport who has never been through TSA before and doesn't take off their shoes and uh, r ridiculous things like that. So I hope to, it was supposed to be launched 13 months ago. So I'm a bit behind, but uh, <laughs> even though you're retired and don't have a job, <laughs> life gets hectic. And I was going to say, like, I'm curious how you keep on track for the things that you want to do. So we talked about sort of a daily and a weekly approach, but like quarterly, do you have a look? I know you do like annual uh, reviews at the end of the year and kind of reflect on what what happened in the last year, what you're aiming for in the in the coming year. So do, do you go back to it like periodically through the year to make sure you're on track? Um, yeah, I do actually go back and look at it. Some things just drop by the wayside. Like uh, last year, we bought another home and it was kind of a spontaneous purchase, which sounds pretty crazy from buying the, one of the most expensive things you ever buy. So when that happens, certain goals get thrown out the window and, and new goals happen because you got to move and uh, other things come up. But yeah, I do go back and I think it's important to reflect because uh, like you think of with working out with strength training, it's hard to lose your, your mojo and it's easy to dismiss a day and then that becomes a week and then that becomes a month. So if you look at these goals and especially if you post them publicly, you feel you've got a little bit of external pressure to keep up with them. Very good. And do you feel, I guess, have you gotten much like, let me rephrase that like pros and cons of having the blog. Like I, th I'm, I imagine just knowing from having my blog and other platform, like uh, more people will talk to you. It's a good way to uh, like network just sort of indirectly. So yeah, any pros and cons of like just having the blog and public being so like forthright on a lot of these personal items? Yeah, it's been a weird transition. I guess I'll start with the, with the cons first. Um, it's always weird putting yourself out there like, uh, uh, one of the reasons, another reason I thought I had to put my money is out there is you can't really, it's silly to write about this goal of accumulating this money and not being open about it. I thought I had to be transparent. And I think anyone should be like that. It always cracks me up when you see someone with a blog, I like my goals to do this any amount of push-ups or do this and this, and then they don't show any pictures or documentation of it. I, you need evidence and I've got a scientific mind. So, but again, that's a risk too. I'm putting my net worth out there. If people Google me, they can find out where I live. And uh, my wife's a public figure too. We've had, uh, we have security cameras on our house because once in a while there's a nasty person out there, but uh, it's been overwhelmingly positive. I thought we would get a lot more shit thrown at us, but it's not really that bad. No one has shown up on our doorstep or anything like that. I know that's actually happened to Pete. It's overwhelmingly positive. I would do it again in a second because of the, the networking, the friends I've made through the blog. I've got friends like, uh, what would that be, like PB, like uh, <laughs> pre-blog era, but uh, most of the people I hang out with and see on my day-to-day -day basis are people who I've networked or met through my blogging or through this co-working space, which is also a result of the blog. So I'm, I'm very thankful for it. And that's the, the money is nice, but the number one thing I get from it is the are, are the people and the relationships I've made and the fun projects I get to do with some of these people. Very cool. And uh, last couple questions here. Is there something that you've like changed your opinion on in the like personal finance world just in general? Uh, yeah, actually there is. So uh, I thought I was smarter than I was, and I tried to diversify by various real estate investments, um, syndication deals, a trailer park, and some other things. If I were to do everything over again, I think I just would have kept it simple and stayed with VTSAX. Uh, these other things require mental bandwidth. You have to do research, and even you research them a ton. You do the numbers, but there's always subjective things that come up that you could not have anticipated, like this syndicator is doing a deal outside of their home market. So they picked a terrible place to invest and it turned out the deal was horrible. The numbers they put out were great, but it turned out those numbers were written with, uh, I think they thought that those numbers were good, but it turns out they weren't because they got out of their zone and didn't know what they were doing. If I would have just kept all my money in VTSAX and done index funds, I would have been farther ahead than I than I would have been now, probably by I don't know, maybe a hundred thousand dollars, and that's these are just decisions I've made since 2016. So it's very weird, and it's very hard to wrap your mind around it. But in investing, the simple answer is the right one, and that's buy an index fund. And don't, don't worry about it; it's great because you don't have to consume your mental bandwidth, and it takes care of itself. Self cleansing yeah. and uh, 
that's a whole other topic. But yeah, just keep it simple. Unless you really, really know what the hell you're doing, like you have a high degree of confidence. I still do. My live and flips will be a great investment. These houses I bought, but they took years of research to do, and um, I'm doing much of the work myself. So I'm confident those will work out just because I've put so much thought into it. But otherwise, I'm just going with VTSA, VTSAX from here on out, the whole market index fund. Okay. Yep. And I was about to say, so it's the whole market index fund from Vanguard, right? Correct. Okay, cool. All right. Well, you have a few places where people can follow you. I know you got a YouTube channel, so we'll link up to that. And that's where you're covering this the house renovation, right? Yeah, I'm showing my whole house renovation on YouTube, on a YouTube channel. So I hope to educate and inspire some people through that because people are generally, I find, afraid to do their own work. Electricity is not scary. Take proper precaution. Don't shock yourself because I just right. said that. But plumbing, electricity... Home remodel does not have to be scary. I did not know how to do any of it a couple decades ago. And look at you now. Yeah. <laughs> you got the YouTube channel and then you have your blog. So what's the URL there? Yeah, I still have the blog. That's 1500days.com. Just the number 1500days.com. Very good. Anywhere else you want people to, to check out? If you Google that, I've uh, been ramping up my Instagram so you can see some of my pictures on there. I'm on Twitter too. Uh, Retiring 1500, I think is that. But uh yeah, that's about it. If you're here in Longmont, um, come see us at our co-working space right here on Main Street. Um, fantastic group of people. I'm very thankful for this community that we have right here. Yeah, so. it's awesome. It's cool to have people that uh, like understand like what we're doing <laughs> like in general. And they know like the affiliate marketing stuff that I'm doing too. People just kind of understand side hustle kind of things. So it's, yeah. it's an awesome group. Super awesome group. Yeah. So thanks a lot, Carl. We'll link up to everything and I appreciate your time today. Yeah, you're welcome, Doug. Thank you so much for having me. And I want to give a, a quick plug for you know Carl's YouTube channel. Check out his blog as well. There's going to be a link in the description. And if you are new to this channel, my name is Doug Cunnington. I talk about affiliate marketing, productivity, niche sites, making money on the side, SEO. So check out some of the other videos if you're interested in getting into affiliate marketing or checking out a side hustle. You may like some of the other videos out there.